Okay, let's talk about value at risk, often abbreviated VAR. What I'm going to do in this video is, is look at VAR, and we're going, to do, we're going to jump in first to do a calculation of VAR like you're most likely to do on an exam and in, in, in a course dealing with an introduction to, to VAR. Uh, and then after that, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about, well, how would it be implemented in the real world and uh, why is it important? But so jumping into just the calculation of to value at risk, what we want to be able to say at the end of the calculation is a statement like we are 99% uh, certain our portfolio will not lose more than X dollars over the next N days. Right? So that's the statement we want to make. This is often compactly written as uh, this, the probability of our loss greater than or equal to the VAR that we want is less than 0.01. So you'll, you'll see it often written like this. But what we want to say is this statement right here. And so let's go through a brief example. Again, I'm going to assume here that the portfolio returns are normally distributed. Uh, and I'm also going to assume independent increments, changes in our portfolio over time. Right? This is what's usually done in your sort of first calculation of the AR. And, and so what I'm going to do here is I'll calculate 10-day 99% VAR. So to start off, uh, we're given the annualized volatility on our portfolio is 24%. All right, so if you give me the annualized volatility of the portfolio is 24%, then I can calculate the, the this is the, the, uh, the um, annualized volatility, annualized, uh, this is the standard deviation of returns, right? Uh, is 24%. Then I can take 24.24 divided by the square root of 252 for 252 uh, trading days of the year. This gives me a daily standard deviation of 1.5%. Now, if I want a one-day VAR, then, then I don't have to do this next step. But assuming I want a 10-day VAR, then I need to take this 1.5% daily volatility, daily standard deviation, multiply it by the square root of 10 for, for 10 trading days. Uh, and this gives me a 4.74% uh, st uh, standard deviation over a 10-day period. So uh, over a 10-day period, uh, one standard deviation of my portfolio is going to be 4.74%. Now, this is where, uh, and now what we've done here is, again, this is, this is assumed independent increments. And what we're about to do here is going to assume the normal distribution. So the idea of this is, in assuming the normal distribution, right, then I'm going to get, what's what number is, uh, uh, um, how many standard deviations away is uh, uh, 1%, right? So the idea here is how, how many standard deviations do I have to be away to get, a, uh, to be able to pull a number with less probability than, uh, than, than 1%. So it, assuming the normal distribution, this would be 2.33. So uh, you, are, you are less than 1% likely to get a number larger than 2.33 standard deviations, right? So the idea here is I can take my 4.74% uh, 10 day standard deviation, multiply it by 2.33, and that gives me 11.5%. So the idea here is over a 10 day period, I'm less than, I'm 99% certain I won't lose more than 11%. Right? That's what this calculation is saying here. And then once, you know, assuming a portfolio value of 100 million, then I can just take my portfolio, my 11%, multiply it by 100 million, and say I'm 99% certain that I will uh, not lose more than 11.5%. Uh, 0.5 million over the next 10 days, right? So that's a, a very simple calculation of, of value at risk. One thing I should say that I've done here is I've assumed, and this is commonly done, I've assumed that the mean change in my portfolio over the 10 days is zero. Uh, and this is based on the principle that uh, as you decrease your time horizon, the standard deviation becomes much more important, uh, a much more, a, a larger factor relative to, to the mean. So what you can do here is I can sort of summarize these calculations. Uh, let me write it up here to give you sort of a one-line way to calculate this. The, the calculation, again, assuming independent increments in a normal distribution, uh, the VAR would be our portfolio value times 2.33, assumes a normal distribution, times the standard deviation minus the mean. Right, so if you know on an exam you're you're assuming independent increments in a normal distribution. If you're given a mean, then you would subtract it here. Otherwise, um, you know, just 2.33 times the standard deviation times the portfolio value. Now, using this formula, one thing to keep in mind is if you're asked for 10-day VAR, then this has to be your 10-day standard deviation in percent uh, and your 10-day mean in percent. Uh, if you're if you're asked for a one-day VAR, then this is just your one-day standard deviation and your one-day mean. Uh, 
Good. So you have to make sure that these are, you know, appropriate to 10 day or one day. The idea here is again, if this is just one day, then you would stop at 1.5%. If this is 10 day, then multiply by the square root of 10. So, so not tough. All right. So this is this is the the calculation you'll most likely see in a textbook. Switching over a little bit to first, why is this important? Well, it's important because it's written in regulations, right? So the idea is banking regulations when banks uh, report their their capital adequacy, they banks look at when they, we talk about whether a bank has sufficient capital, we're saying, well, what's the probability that they're going to lose so much that they run through their, their capital? Remember, capital is like a cushion to a bank. So the idea here is VAR is, uh, a very, is always included in, in, in capital adequacy reports for that reason. So it says it gives you an idea of how likely they are to lose, their, to, to lose you know, something equivalent to their capital base. So, and that's why, you know, when I, when I went through this 10-day, 99% VAR, this is often known as regulatory capital, right? Or, or sorry, regulatory VAR. Uh, this as opposed to something like um, often one day, 95% VAR uh, would be something like management VAR that would be used internally uh, to, to, to manage risk, whereas 10-day, 99% VAR would be what you would report to regulators. And I, I think that's uh, Morgan Stanley uses as internally uh, uh, one day 95% VAR as is management VAR and, and this for, for uh, regulatory VAR. So, so that's now, you know, so that's why it's important. Again, it's important. You know, there, there, are, there are pluses and minuses to value. There are pluses there are, and minuses. There are good things about it. There are bad things about the calculation or the idea of it. Uh, however, it is important because it is, is written in the regulations. Uh, now, how is it calculated? Well, the, 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 the regulations would be how you report value at risk, but uh, the regulators don't tell you exactly how to calculate it. So the bank can calculate how they wish. And would a bank calculate it like this? No, right? A bank would generally use a very large simulation. Uh, they're not going to simply assume a normal distribution for their portfolio. So the actual bank's calculation of value at risk would be much more involved in this, right? Uh, uh, looking at the risk of every individual asset in the portfolio and so forth. Uh, so it's important to know that what, what the regulator wants to say is they, the regulators look for how you report the VAR, not how you actually uh, calculate it. That said, uh, banks will report VAR and, and regulators and banks will go back and say, okay, this was what you said your VAR was and did it match up with reality? So you can go after the fact and start looking at how accurate their uh, their, their, their VAR uh, calculation has been historically, right? Because again, one of the problems here is, you know, right here we're assuming that uh, that's our standard deviation. Often this is calculated with historical data, so you're using often historical data, but, but you really should include some uh, implied volatility and so forth to predict the future, so we can go back and, and always look at how well your predictions did. So, uh, so I mentioned that to say, no one tells the bank how to calculate the value at risk. However, uh, people do go back and see how accurate the value at risk calculations were. Last thing I'll mention, one of the things here is when is uh, value at risk most important? Well, obviously value at risk is most important in a market crash, right? So what you might say is, well, any calculation that you did beforehand is going to be irrelevant in a market crash, as, as we see uh, maybe with crude oil right now. This is uh, any parameter that you estimated about crude oil if, if you're watching this video uh, and you don't know um, what I mean in terms of crude oil, it might be years later, uh, crude oil recently went negative, the prices went negative. So any, any parameters you estimated beforehand you know, become increasingly irrelevant during times of market stress. So banks will also, and I'll, I'll talk about this maybe in a later, really, later video, calculate stress value at risk. And this basically says, okay, I'm going to start calculating my parameters that are going to go into value at risk but I'm only going to use times of market stress to estimate my parameters. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, there, there are some downsides to this, but there are also ways that we are improving value at risk. So, to sum up, uh, simple calculation of value at risk. Again, always keep in the back of your head that this is the statement we want to make. We're 99% sure that our portfolio will not lose more than 11 million over the next 10 days, right? That's the statement. You'll see it written like this. Uh, Brief example and, um, and uh, why it's important, and it definitely is important. All right, have a great day.